Here we go. Don't tell. Hello. Hello. Well, come on in. Avery. Oh, and you brought Will with you this morning. Hello, Will. How are you doing? I'm glad you two are here. Yes. Oh, I hope you had a, a good uh, birthday uh, last week. Uh, it sounded like it was a great celebration. And uh, I wish we were there, but we couldn't. And uh, so I hope all went well. Well, today we're going to um, we're going to finish up lesson six. Uh, we'll touch base with a, a little bit of sound that we talked about before, and then finish light. And uh, and then we're going to talk about we'll get into earth science. We're going to talk about the earth and things of that nature. I'll tell you right at the end. So we covered a lot on sound. And uh, the most important thing about sound is sound has to have a vibration in order to produce the waves that go into our ear and uh, bounce against our eardrums. And the, uh, the way those vibrations can be created is with a drum, with the reeds in a in an instrument like a clarinet, air blown over a recorder, or <laughs> lips vibrating in a uh, in a trumpet, um, some of those simple tools like levers banging on strings in a piano. So that's what sound is, and we we can't see it, but there are definitely waves uh, that go along that we can we can uh, we know that they're there. Here's some waves that we talked about that we can't hear the sound, but these are a whole bunch of different kind of waves. The one on the top is a long, stretched out wave of low frequency. The one in the bottom is a higher frequency. As you can see, it bounces up and down considerably. Uh, and we'll come, uh, come back to that in, uh, in just a couple of minutes. So those are the things that we can't see. Uh, there are other waves out there all around. We get hit with waves all day, and most of them come from different, uh, different places, and that leads us to talk about light. And there's some waves that hit us every day, and they come from, let me give you a hint of where they would come from. Yeah? You know what that could be? Yes, you're right. That's the sun. They come from uh, the sun, and the sun has got a lot of different waves that we're going to explore, and it's another source of energy. We talked about thermal energy before. We talked about chemical energy in plants and in the food in your stomach, um, and there's energy that comes from the sun, and the sun is our biggest source of, of energy. In fact, if we could take all that energy from the sun in a three-foot by three-foot section and just get all that and absorb that, we could light a hundred light bulbs, LED light bulbs. It's tremendous. The sun is actually a big furnace. It takes hydrogen and burns it and converts it to helium and produces a lot of photons. We'll talk about that later. And uh, into energy, which travels 186,000 miles per second. It takes about... Um, Oh, eight minutes for that to get from the sun to us to here on the earth. But inside there is a lot of energy, and we'll talk about that. And that's the light we're going to be talking about. The other uh, elements uh, for light here, how can we produce light? Years ago is chemical. It was um, burning things, making a little campfire, burning candles, oil, um, and things of that nature. Electricity. We use electricity to turn light bulbs on, and things uh, things of, uh, of of that sort. Fireflies. We talked about that. They've got a chemical named luciferin that combines with oxygen and makes it glow like one of those little glow sticks that you use, where you break it, and that starts a chemical reaction on the inside, and it glows. Those fireflies can be anywhere from red to green to yellow. We've got kind of a greenish yellow here. There are um, man-made uh, light sources as well. And uh, Nona's here. And Nona's going to help us talk about a couple of those if we can. Nona, can you give us a helping hand here, please? 
I'd like to show sure. like to show Will and Avery some Hi, of those Avery and Will? some of those uh, light bulbs that we talked about the other day. If you can show me uh, okay. one of those old ones there first. Um, the old filament light bulb. All right. Let me pull my table over closer. Mm -hmm. This yes, one. yes. That's a filament light bulb. Let me see if I put that right next to it, if you can see the filament. I'm not sure. If you look inside there, there you go. You see a little wire going across the top. That's the old kind of light bulbs where they used to put electricity. Thomas Edison invented that. And the electricity would go through that wire and heat it up, make it very, very hot and very, very bright. But the problem with these light bulbs is that it produced a tremendous amount of heat. So it took the energy and converted most of it to heat instead of light. So that was kind of a waste of a lot of electricity that we had on it. Thank you, hon. Can you show me the fluorescent one, the big fluorescent tube? Then came along these tubes that Nona has in her hand. That's the fluorescent light that you see in a lot of shop spaces, in a lot of stores that you go into. That makes light, uh, but it's a little dangerous and enough for someone just standing there. But uh, inside is mercury vapor. It's got some fluorescent coating on the inside of it. But electricity comes in, the electrons travel down that particular tube and ignite that vapor and produce light. It's a little more efficient than uh, the, uh, the light bulb with the little filament in it. But it could be dangerous if it breaks and you get all that food uh, fumes in there. Next came these little guys that Nona has right now. That's a CFL, curved fluorescent light. It's the same as the other one. It's just curved around, but it's still got some toxic material on the inside of it if you ever break it and twist it into, into pieces. Next comes what's which just happened here recently, in the last couple of years, since about when you were born. This is an LED light. And uh, you can see them on Christmas trees. You see them in your little Averyville. It's got all LED lights in it. Uh, little LED lights are in computers and things of this nature. And what's good about it, if you've ever seen it, is it doesn't get hot. If Nona was putting her finger on a, one of those filament lights, it would be very hot. But these don't get hot. These are very efficient and take a lot of the energy and converts it almost all to light. So we, can only use, we only have to use a little bit of energy to make that thing light and get as much light. So it's really a good thing, and it's not dangerous if it breaks. You just throw it away and buy another, but it lasts a very, very uh, long time. Now remember, those are waves, the waves of uh, energy coming out of the sun, like the sound was as well. And uh, as we studied, when we studied sound, that, uh, that sound waves go into our ear, through the eardrum and the bones, and into the uh, area where the uh, little fibers are, little hairs are that pick up the, uh, the movement and vibrations, which is important for sound, and it sends it to the nerves. Now, if we want to look at everything that's under the sun, this is it here. Now, this is a big, they call it a spectrum, but it's everything that is being released and all the waves and we can't see most of them. And these waves are coming from the, uh, the sun. Now on the left hand side is there's radio waves, waves that are going through the air all the time, that are around us all the time. And we can pick them up on our cell phones, uh, on our radios in our cars, uh, when we're communicating in the boat and things of that nature. They're radio waves and you can see by the scribbly line on top, they're kind of low frequency. And those sound waves, if you go a little bit to the right now, you can get into ultrasound. And you know what ultrasound is because you've seen the ultrasound when you first looked at Will before he even showed up. That ultrasound is bounced um, off Will and back out again, and they can make these shadows that show us exactly what it's like. Next along that line, you see a little microwave. Microwave energy comes from the sun, and scientists have learned to be able to use that energy for something good on Earth. And what it is, is that microwave energy will, will make the atoms inside a water molecule bounce around and produce energy and get hot. 
So whatever food has got water in it and you run it through a microwave, it cooks the food. So we've been able to, uh, to use that. The next is x-rays. And x-rays help us show what is inside uh, a body for medical uh, purposes. This right here is known as back. And you can see that she has got a couple little bars in there and 18 screws holding her back together. But years ago, you wouldn't be able to see that. Now the x-rays, we can use in x-ray machines, just like the sun sends us x-rays all the time, which aren't too damaging to us because it's a long distance. But we can see what is taking place in there, and doctors can, can modulate uh, all that and, uh, and see what's happening to it. Now there is one area inside this particular piece right in the middle. You can see that we've gone from the left side through radio waves and ultrasound microwaves into something else there that's got a little sun on it and then on the other side is x-rays and then way to the right is gamma rays. Those are very very damaging. We don't have any way to protect ourselves with that but here on Earth we're not getting too much but if you get up into the space station you get a lot of gamma rays once in a while. You got to be careful about that. But in the middle there are some waves that we can see. Those are right in the middle. It comes out of the sun. It's called white light. And it, inside that white light is a whole bunch of seven different lights, each one with a slightly different frequency. This, coincidentally, is the chart I showed you when we talked about sound to show you what waves look like. But these are the waves that come out of the white light from the sun. On the top is you can see it's a lower frequency and the waves are spread apart. That's red. And then as the waves get more compressed, we get red. And uh, it's like Roy G. B. red, orange, yellow, green in the middle, about uh, uh, the mid range of frequencies down into the blue and the ultraviolets. That's what's coming out of the sun. And we can take that and we can find that. We can spread those out, and it's called a prism. Hey, could you give me the prism, please? And the prism takes that white light and separates it because each one of those colors is a different frequency, just like every note in sound was a different frequency. And they bend differently. If you can follow me on this, you'll see that the light coming from the sun comes into that prism and it's bent. It's called refraction, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And it's bent. The red is, can only be bent a little bit. The yellow and the orange there can be bent a little bit more. And the green, blue, uh, and ultraviolet can be bent a lot. So we can send the light through that prism and have it spread. And we can look at it when it's, uh, when it's spread. And you'll be able to see it by frequencies if you use your prism and let the sun come in. This is a, Nona did this the other day in the kitchen. Put the prism in the sunlight and it spread out. And uh, there we have it. Now you can take the prism if you've got a prism. I think I sent you one. You should have gotten it by now. But you take that prism and you set it like this and have the sun come in right about like this. Right along that side there. And in the middle of it it will, it will bend, and each one of the colors will bend a little bit differently, and it'll come out the other side. And if you put a little piece of paper here, you'll be able to see the rainbow on it. And you could also take that, put it on a windowsill, and you'll see, see it going on different places in the ceiling. And you can also look, if you look down one of these sharp edges right here, just put it, put it up over to your eyes and look through, you'll see colors all over the place that, are, that we call are refracted, bent. I'm now looking at the desk and I see all the rainbow colors. Give it a try. What we're doing is we're taking that sunlight that is white light that we can't really see, but we'll go. This is some of the colors that we just talked about. These are the primary colors, and I know you know about those primary colors. They're red, green, and blue. Um, and you can uh, mix those all together. Uh, into colored lights and it would make um, actually white light if you pull them all together but then you can mix them differently if the red and green and blue lights are all pulled together uh, then we see them as white light 
and where two primary colors overlap, they produce a secondary color. Red and blue make uh, magenta, red and green make yellow, and green and blue make cayenne. And you know that. You know all those particular pieces of that as well. Now that was um, that was prob that was just light. Now, now, as Nona told me, that's not the same as when you use paint. They come out to be different colors, uh, and that's because what you see when you have paint and leaves, and for, for instance, a leaf reflects green and not all the other colors. So if you mix it up with something else, it would reflect it. So the paint is a little different, but that's with light that's coming out of uh, the sun. Uh, now, there's, uh, there's a couple things that light can do. The light coming out of the sun can be absorbed. As you know, uh, we talk about dark clothing. It absorbs the, uh, the light and, uh, and makes you warm. Uh, that's the infrared radiation coming out of the sun. You can't see it, but it's there. Uh, it can be reflected, and reflection is uh, very, very significant. We have a, in a mirror, or actually if there's something dark behind a glass at night, it would reflect. Or the light can be reflected off the water at night, and we see it, probably not in the daytime. That's what light can do. It can reflect as well. And the big reflector that we have in the sky that follows us around, and we see it most of the time, is the moon. The moon's a big reflector, and it re reflects a lot of the energy coming from the sun. So if it's in the right position, uh, it would reflect all of the light coming from the sun, and that would be a full moon. Uh, a rearview mirror, we can see reflections coming off of that. A telescope. Putting a telescope in the sky brings the light into the telescope and magnifies it through lenses so we can see far away. And that's the reflection capability. Now, I just want to show you this again. This is a laser. And uh, the scientists learned to use light to amplify it, to make it bigger, to make it more powerful by using the capability of light to reflect off mirrors. So if you put some light in a little tube and uh, you, you light it off, uh, actually, through electricity, it's helium and nion, and it excites all the molecules in there, but it gets stronger and stronger. And it bounces back from a mirror where I have the two arrows there, from one arrow to the next arrow, and back and forth again, and it gets more and more powerful, and it becomes a laser that comes out of the right-hand side. Uh, and that can be used for a bunch of things. It can be used for eye surgery. People use lasers for eye surgery. For surveying, to see distances, they can shoot a laser at some place and see right where it lands. For cutting steel, they use lasers. They become so powerful that they can cut steel. And when you use barcodes, a lot of barcodes are in the shopping centers and, and stores. Barcodes are lasers. There's one thing, this brings something to, to for me to remember, and that is for you. Make sure when you're working with things such as chemicals and lasers and anything scientific, make sure you wear goggles. Protect yourself. Those lasers can be very dangerous. When I was a test pilot, I did some testing work where they, I would fly an airplane and they would track me with lasers and they would check me. Every night I came back to make sure I wasn't doing any damage. And we developed a special visor that we could fly with to protect us against lasers. And uh, when I was flying in another place once, someone on the ground shot a laser at me in my airplane. And uh, fortunately, um, I was able to close my eyes right away, but it can be very damaging. The lesson I want you to take is whenever you do anything, like these chemical experiments or around a laser, protect yourself, as it can do a lot of damage to you. Let me show you something else. It's about refraction. See those two arrows? One's going to the left, and one is going to the right. And I put a glass of water in between the two. Nona's going to slowly pull that paper up. And let's see what is taking place here. Go ahead, Nona. Pick that up very slowly. Whoa! Do that. Now put that back down again. What's going on here? 
the one on the bottom is changing completely. Pick that up again. Let's see what's going on here. Wow. Well, let me explain exactly what's taking place there. Now, what happens when light goes through things like water or little raindrops or things like that? It is bent. We saw light going through a prism. But sometimes all the light at one single time will bend as well. Now the light coming through this particular jar is bent. And, and then it hits the other side and comes back out and is bent again. So when it goes into the water, it's bent. And then when it comes out, it's, uh, it's bent uh, a, another time. Now this is a real confusing diagram. Nona says I probably shouldn't have used this one. But if you look at the arrow on the bottom, the light from that arrow, let's just look at the tip of it. The light from the arrow goes and hits that, that jar. We're looking down on that jar of water right now, and it is bent. And you can see the yellow line is bent in. It goes all the way across the other side, and then when it hits the, um, the outside, it's bent again. So the arrow, your eye over on the right, thinks the arrow head is down there. And the same thing happens with the other side of it. That's called refraction. And it slows and it causes that to go down. If you ever uh, look at, uh, perhaps look at a, a when you look at a straw going into a glass of water, it looks like it's bent slightly. Or if you look through the from a dock, you look at it, the light is bent down. That's called refraction. It's the bending of the light. And we saw that in the prism. When we bent it in the prism, each one of those different colors changes just a little bit. Red, not so much the uh, the purples and the blues a lot so that's called refraction now the um, when we're talking about the prism of course the light comes through that prism is divided same thing happens when rain uh, gets between you and the sun and the rain coming through those little droplets of water is bent the same way just like the prism so we have red orange yellow green blue indigo violet and we can see uh, the rainbow because of the refraction of those particular pieces. Well, let's, uh, let's look at this piece of machinery that we carry around all the time. This is an eyeball looking through a uh, lens. And uh, what we see there is this is nearsighted. From a nearsighted perspective, it means you can see near, and you can't see the far side. So you need the far side uh, ampli amplified, I, I made a little bit bigger. And your eyeball, you see there, the light is coming from the left, and it goes through that particular lens. You see the way that lens is shaped? And then it's spread out a little bit and made bigger by those two red arrows I have there. goes through the lens in your eye, and you can uh, see it better. Now, if you're nearsighted, and uh, if uh, you, that was the nearsighted one, you need to have that uh, amplified if you're looking at things that are up close to make them look a little bit bigger. Now, if you're farsighted, and you can see far away very well, but you can't see close by, then you have a lens like this. It's shaped like a, a, almost a little curved on both sides together. The light comes from the left, and it goes through, and it's magnified on your particular lens. Then if you're looking back up that lens, you would see that object bigger than it originally was. And that is very, very similar to a magnifying glass. If you looked at a magnifying glass, you would see these particular sides are curved, kind of like this. And the light comes through, and it's focused on your lens. So when you're looking back out, the other side of that lens looks bigger. And that's for nearsighted, as, uh, so you can see better. In and now all this light goes into this piece of, a piece of machinery that I was mentioning to you that we carry around with us all the time called the eyeball. And there's the eyeball in the middle. And the eyeball takes that light and sends it through a lens right where I have the blue arrow and sends it to the back of the eye where the nerves are. And the nerves receive that light. And as you can see, it receives it upside down, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? 
but your brain translates that. There's little cones, what they call cones and rods, in the back. One is for night vision, and the other is for day vision and light. And it sends those little nerves back there, sends it to a major nerve, and sends it up to your brain. So you can... Now, what's very important is you take care of your eyes. And you can build your eyes up. Uh, you can use your glasses to make your eyes stronger and stronger, but also to protect yourself from anything that runs into them because they are so important for you to be able to navigate around. Now, this looks maybe a little complicated, but what it is is in the center is the sun which produces all that energy and all the light that's coming to see us and grow the plants and, and all the, uh, the uh, waves that we, we cannot recognize. But in the middle of it is the visual light that we can divide up into Roy G. Biv. And you see uh, the planet going around, the Earth. The Earth rotates every day. It rotates all the way around to get day and night. And then it goes around the sun. It takes a whole year for it to go around the sun as it's still rotating. But one thing that's interesting, if you can see over in the left-hand side, the sun is tilted. Uh, well, it, it actually is a little bit, but the Earth is tilted quite a bit, 23 and a half degrees. Uh, and it stays in that same position as it rotates all the way around. And over on the left is the sun is shining on the northern part of the world, called the Northern Hemisphere, where we live, and it's summer. And then the sun comes around, and after the summer, the sun is coming on equal amounts of the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, and that's fall. And then way over on the right, six months after it moved from the left side, this, the bottom of the Earth, is getting the sunlight. So that is their summer, but in the northern, it's winter time. And it moves around to spring and starts all the way over again. Now, imagine you're the sun. You're the sun, and here's the earth. The earth is tilted, and it tilts like this. This is uh, no tilt. This is a complete 90 degree tilt. This is 45. This is about 23. That's what the Earth is tilted at as it spins. And uh, all the planets are tilted. Uh, Mars is just about the same as the Earth. Um, uh, Uranus is tipped even that much. It's, uh, it's amazing. But the Earth spins around this particular axis like this. So if you're the Sun and it's tipped to you, you can see that as the earth as the earth is turning and here comes morning morning's coming up on the united states it's summertime the bottom is not getting a lot of sun but the top part where the earth where the united states is and where oregon where i've got that little spot there is and here it comes around again every time it goes around is one day now as the earth moves all the way around the sun it still is tipped and once it'll get back to the other side, six months, and it's tipped away from the sun. Seasons are caused by this tilting that the Earth has of 23 degrees as it goes around the sun. Around the sun once is a whole year. And you have summer, fall, winter, spring, summer again, shining on the northern hemisphere. Let's look at that in a couple of different pictures. First of all, let me let me show you one. The picture before I showed you is the same as this one here. Now what we see over there on the left hand side is it's tilted away. It's a December. So it's winter time. So only the bottom of the earth is getting uh, direct sunlight. And as the earth moves over here, the next one down at the bottom here is in the springtime and the top and that's a vernal equinox the top of the earth and the bottom of the earth are still getting the equal amounts and then it goes over here to the summer solstice it's the time where the sun goes as furthest north and that's because the northern hemisphere is now tipped 
the same amount as it was in the uh, in the winter time but now this tipped towards the sun and getting uh, all the energy in the summertime then we get the uh, autumnal equinox in the September time frame where it's equal from the top and the bottom and then back to the winter solstice where only the bottom part of the earth we have seasons uh -huh. because of season fairies <laughs> no it is mainly because of our Earth's axis. Huh? Our Earth's axis is tilted at an angle of about 23.5 degrees. Hence, as the Earth revolves around the Sun, sometimes the Northern Hemisphere points towards the Sun, while sometimes the Southern Hemisphere. This causes seasons. Oh man, it is too complicated. All right, let us observe the Northern Hemisphere to learn more about seasons. When the northern hemisphere points towards the sun, the sun rays directly strike the northern hemisphere. Thus, the temperatures are high, resulting in summer season in that region. That's where However, we live. When the northern hemisphere points away from the sun, the sun rays fall slanting on it. Thus, the temperatures are low, resulting in, the... in winter season. Lots of snow. When the northern hemisphere is neither oh. tilted towards nor away from the sun, the temperatures are moderate resulting in spring and autumn season. Just about now. <laughs> well, that's enough for today. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy the earth science pieces as we talk about um, how um, tsunamis work and how earthquakes and volcanoes and some of the uh, minerals that we get out of the earth and how it plays with uh, the moon and everything else that takes place. It should be interesting. It's going to be earth science. So we'll spend the next lesson on that. So you make sure you uh, keep your eye on uh, Will there. It looks like he's doing pretty good. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming again. Bye.